me guys. Today we're going to talk about classification of living things. We've already discussed what living things are. We talked about the characteristics of them and um, that they're all made of cells, that they respond to their environment, they reproduce, they get energy or they and use energy and they grow and develop and mature. So those are the living things. Now we are going to take all of those living things and sort them out and help us organize um, everything so that we can better study how they're related and things like that. So that's kind of what this whole lesson is about, is how we sort them out, how we classify them, how we name them. Um, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe um, describe the people, how people sort living things into groups based on shared characteristics. So make sure you have your lesson. You're going to highlight. You'll need a highlighter or a pencil to underline as we go. Answer the questions in here together. Do not fast forward. Do not skip. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And try to, um, if you have any questions, write those down. You can send them to me and I can help you uh, with that later on. So let's go ahead and get started sorting things out. Why do we classify living things? There are millions of living things on earth. I mean, they may think hundreds of millions of things. We have classified it, classified, sorted, and named only about two million things. There were things that um, way back in the past that we don't even know about that are extinct now. There are things we have not even discovered. So we are just beginning to um, learn uh, how these are related and things like that. How do scientists keep all of these living things organized? Scientists classify living things based on characteristics that living things share. Let me see if I can. Um, Okay. Classification helps scientists answer questions such as how many kinds of living things there are, what characteristic defines each kind of living thing, and what are the relationships among these things? Just how do they all relate? And I think by finding out how they relate helps us to know more about them and how what there are other things that are related to. You can um, usually, back a long time ago, before microscopes were invented, before they knew about um, DNA and things like that, all they could do was just look at different organisms and put them into groups, what they could see with their eyes. So if you were looking at these two, I mean obviously you know they're not the same thing, even though they're very similar. It says the photos show two organisms 
Organisms is another word for living things. You need to know that. Organisms is another word for living things. In the table, place a check mark in the box for each characteristic that the organized organism has. Mm. See if I can do that. Okay, so the yellow pansy butterfly, it has wings. Does it have antenna? Yes. Does it have a beak? Does it have feathers? Okay, so that's what we see. We see that it has wings and antenna. Now let's go to the American goldfinch. Does it have wings? Yes. Does it have antenna? No. Does it have a beak? Yes. Does it have feathers? Yes. Hmm. Anyway, now I, that's how you would do. You would just look at it. You would just mark what they have in common, what they have different, um, and then record your findings. Each characteristic. What characteristics do yellow pansy butterflies have in common with the American goldfinch? How do they differ? So you can just see right here, they both have wings. So you can write that down there. They both have wings. That's how they're the same. And then how they're different. The butterfly has antenna. The bird has beak and feathers. So that's how you would start your um, you know, observations and things like that between two, two organisms. This one seems pretty simple. It does get more complex later on. So let's go on to the next page. How do scientists know living things are related? Two organisms look very similar. Are they related? Just because they look similar doesn't necessarily mean they're related. To classify organisms, scientists compare physical characteristics. That means just what they can look at and see what that they look the same. Okay. For example, they may look the same size or they have the same bone structure. Scientists also now compare the chemical characteristics of living things. That means on the inside, they look at their cells and they look at the um, how they're the what's on the inside of the animals. And that's once we have the microscope that's you know helped us to see um, we miscategorize some of these animals. Or living things so that's been super helpful look at the um, they look at the physical characteristics and they look at the chemical characteristics how are chickens similar to dinosaurs if you compare dinosaur fossils and chicken skeletons you will see that chickens and dinosaurs share many physical characteristics Scientists look at the physical characteristics such as their skeletal structure. They also study how organisms develop from an egg to an adult. For example, animals with similar skeletons and development may be related. Then we move down to the chemical characteristics. Scientists can identify the relationship among organisms by studying genetic material such as DNA and RNA. And that's when we talk about cells, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's what are in the cells and kind of what um, each organism is made up of. They study the mutations in genetic similarities to find relationships among organisms. Organisms that have very similar gene sequence or have the same mutations are likely related. Other chemicals 
such as protein and hormones can be studied to learn how organisms are related. So just real quick, if you are looking at this red panda and this giant panda, you would automatically kind of maybe think, oh, they're both pandas, so they're probably related. But that's the physical characteristics. They have a little bit of a some different markings, but um, you might think, well, maybe they are related somehow. But if you look at the chemical characteristics, their, their DNA and things like that, you get a closer look, you can see that the red panda is closely related relative to the raccoon than it is the giant panda. You can really see very uh, even more physical characteristics there. Look at the little markings. You can see the tails are the same. The only thing is that uh, maybe the color is just um, different. Also the giant panda is a close relative to a speckled bear. You can kind of see, we can see some resemblance there too, but also maybe their chemical characteristics are the same. So their uh, DNA makeup um, shows that animals are more closely related than just using their physical characteristics. Okay, let's go to the next page. We only have really just one person that we have to learn about that helped us with this whole system. It says, how are living things named. Long, long, long time ago, early scientists used to name, have give names to things like 12 words long to identify these um, living things. They also used common names. So classification was super, super confusing. In the 1700s, finally the scientists named Carolus Linnaeus, some people call him Carl, Carlus Linnaeus, simplified it, and he made it super, oh, well, not super easy, it is still confusing, but he simplified it, um, simplified the naming of living things. He gave each kind of living thing two part specific names. So that's way better than 12 words for each living thing. Let's see here. Let's um, highlight. Let's start here. Let's start at the beginning. In the 1700s, a scientist named Carlos, Carlos Linnaeus simplified and Naming of living things. And what does he do here? Two parts. Okay, that's him right there. Specific uh, scientific names. We are not going to go into this. I'm just introducing this to you when you get um, higher into junior high and high school. You'll go into this. Um, more, but you just need to know basically um, how we use the scientific names. So each species has its own spe uh, scientific name. A species, I highlight that, is a group of organisms that are very closely related. They can mate and produce fertile offspring. Consider the scientific name for a mountain lion, Puma, color. The first part, Puma, is the 
genus name, not genius, genus. Genus, you need to know what that is. It includes similar um, species. The second part, color, uh, con color is the specific or the species name. No other species is named Puma Concolor. A scientific name always includes the genus name followed by the specific name. The first letter of the genus name is capitalized and the first letter of the specific name is lowercase. The entire specific name is written either in italics or underlined. So that's really about all you need to know. We're going to know about that, okay? You're not going to have to name them. You're just going to have to know that the first word in the scientific name is the genus name and the second name is the species name. This will make a lot more sense when we get to the other side, to the next page. So this, um, this right here, depending on what country you live in or what um, area you're from, you may call this a mountain lion, you may call this a puma, you may call this a cougar, you may call this a panther. They're all the same thing. And that's why it was so confusing. We all had little made-up names for the different animals, but it's all the same animal. So using the scientific name, we all have no doubt which animal you're talking about. Same for plants, same for bacteria, same for other things that we're studying. So. Um, That's why it's important to, to have this system set up. So this is where the where genus and species fit in to, to um, the system is these last two um, levels right here. And we're going to talk with this a little bit about this. You may need to know this. Um, classification, classifying organisms, you may need to know this, but we're not going to get too far into all of that, okay? We're just introducing you. This is just the introduction level. So what are the levels of classification? Linnaeus idea um, ideas became the basis for modern taxonomy. You need to know what taxonomy is. Taxonomy is the science of describing, classifying, and naming living things. So we have to name what the system is that we are used to name things. <laughs> Does that make any sense? So taxonomy is how we name things, how we describe it, classify it, and name it. At the first, many scientists sorted organisms into just two groups. It was super easy. Way, way, way back then, either you're a plant or you're an animal. And that's all they knew because that's really all they could see. We hadn't gotten microscopes yet. And we didn't have, um, couldn't do DNA testing and things like that. So either it was a plant or an animal. Um, but numerous organisms did not fit into either group. There were some things that we thought they looked like a plant but it acted like an animal, or vice versa. So they had to make more than just two groups. Um, today, scientists use an eight-level system to classify living things. Each level gets more specific. So let's see here. Today, we use an eight. Oh, I'm all over the place. Eight-level system to classify things. They used to have seven, but um, 
once they started classifying things, they realized some of these don't fit in either group. So they had to add another group. And I think probably eventually, the more we discover, the more we understand, the more groups we may have. But for right now, this system has worked very well for us. Each level gets more specific. Therefore, it contains fewer kinds of living things than the level above it. And um, as we get down, down late, well, I'll just wait for that. Living things in the lower levels are more closely related to each other than they are to organisms in the higher levels. From most general to more specific, the levels of classifications are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so really all they're just saying that you see how all of these organisms can fit in here. This is very general. If you're um, for a kingdom, if you're an animal, then you can be in this, this category. But then you go down to the next one. You have to be an animal and you have to have a backbone. So that kind of ruled out the butterfly because it it's an animal, but it doesn't have a backbone. So it kind of rules things out, and it gets more specific. Go down to the next level. You have to be an animal. You have to have a backbone and nurse young. Okay, so that's what those are here. Next level down, animal. You have to have a backbone. You have to nurse young, and you have to have special teeth for tearing meat. So we know those are carnivores. These are all meat eaters, meat eater animals. So we do have some sharp teeth, but we have um, flat teeth too because we eat plants. We're more herbivores, not carnivores. Um, so it kind of gets a little bit more specific. So it starts ruling things out as you go down the list. Does that make sense? Then go down here to the next one. They are carnivores. They're animals. They have a backbone. They nurse their young. They have special teeth, which are carnivores. And they have retractable claws. Okay, so they're right here. He's kicked out because he has claws, but they don't retract. So we're getting a little bit more specific. Finally, we get down here. It has to have all of those above qualifications, and they purr. They don't roar. So here goes the little tiger. He has to leave now. These are the only two that fit all of those qualifications. And then finally, we get down here to the last one. They have to have all of those. And they have to be domesticated or they have to be like not wild. They live in the uh, in a house or something like that, a house cat. So we moved all the way down to this um, level. This is the most specific. None of these can fit into this because they don't meet those qualifications. So that's kind of what um, this system is designed to do. For each and every living thing. And we've done, what, two million of these. So that's a lot. So right down here it says, number 10, it says, what, are, what is true about the number of organisms that are classified closer to the specific, um, species level? So as we get down to the species level, what do you know about the number? The number gets less and less and less as it goes down 
and it gets more specific. Go back up here. It says um, living things in the lower levels are most more closely related to each other than they are to organisms in the higher levels. Okay, and then finally, we're not, if you look at this very first um, level, it used to start with kingdom, but then they had to go back, and the more we learn, the more we study, the more we discover, uh, we realized we needed to have a level that comes before this. And so that's what it talks about here. What are the three domains? Uh, once kingdom was the highest level of classification, scientists used a six kingdom system, but scientists noticed that organisms in two of the kingdoms differ greatly from the organisms in the other four kingdoms. So scientists added the new classification level, domains. And so a domain, I need to know this right here represents the largest difference among organisms. Domain represents the largest difference among living things. And the three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Now, Really, all you have to know are those three domains. When we get into cells, when we, we're going to have a whole lesson on um, bacteria and archaea and I think other things. So I just want you to know that this, these are the domains. You don't have to worry about all of this right now. You can definitely read it if you want, but um, we're going to just skip on to that. All you need to know are the three domains. Um, a class by themselves, you can read this on your own. It just talks about how scientists, the more they learn, the more they read, the more they um, discover different species and different animals or plants or bacteria, <laughs> they realize that it's kind of hard to put them in one category or another. And so that they have to sometimes come create a new category. As scientists find more living things to study, they find that they may not have made enough classifications or that their classifications may not describe organisms well enough. Some living things have traits that fall under more than one classification. These organisms are very difficult to classify. So this is a sea spider. You would think, oh, it's a spider. We'll put it in the animals um, and or put it with all the other spiders. No, you can't. There's something special about this one that kind of that the other spiders don't have. So do they create a new group or do they ch change the classification for the spider category? What do they do? So uh, sea spiders. It's very difficult to classify animals. It is an arthropod because it has body segments and it is an, has an exoskeleton. The problem is that sea spiders mouth. They eat by sticking a straw-like structure into sponges and sea slugs and sucking out the juices. Um, so I guess kind of like a mosquito. It has a so it doesn't act like a spider, like on the other things. Um, scientists, no other ar arthropod eats like this. Scientists must describe if they need to make a newer classification or change the existing one to account for this strange mouth. Uh, Euglena. An even stranger group of creatures is the Euglena 
Euglenas make their own food as plants do, so you would think, well, maybe it's a plant. But when you look at the chemical characteristics, you look at the inside, it does not have cell walls, and plants have cell walls. So do, do we put it with the plant, or do we put it with the animals, or put it with something else? They have a flagellum, which is a tail-like structure that bacteria have. So do we put it with the bacteria? Uh, despite ha having all of these characteristics, Eugenus have been classified as protists. So that's where they um, put this character, this uh, organism. So it can get kind of confusing, like I said, as it gets down lower. Well, this is the last thing. I was going to wait till tomorrow to go over this or the next day, but um, we can do this real quick because we're going to do an activity on Friday, I hope. And so I want you to have a little bit of an understanding about what a dichotomous key is, if you don't know what that is already. So how do organism, how can organisms be identified? Imagine walking through the woods. You see an animal sitting on a rock. It is it has fur, whiskers, and a large flat tail. How can you find out what kind of animal it is? You can use this dichotomous key. A dichotomous key uses a series of paired statements, pair meaning two, to identify the organism. Each pair of statements is numbered when Identifying an organism, read each pair of statements. You have to read both of them. And then you choose which one best goes with um, the organism. Either the chosen statement identifies the organism, or you will be directed to another pair of statements. Another um, two statements. By working through the key, you can eventually identify the organism. So, one thing I wanted to put over here, I think it's going to be over there. So I'm going to put this over here. You can write this over here or just have it as a reminder. Always start with number one. Okay, that's an important tip to know. When you're using this key, you look at only one living thing, one organism, and you answer questions until you come up with the answer of what that organism is. So let's uh, do these two right here, and we'll work it through, and then uh, I think Friday or next week, I will give you some sheets of paper, and you can identify the organisms by using a dichotomous key. Um, they have special keys, you know, like not every key fits every door. So if this dichotomous key is set up to identify six mammals in the eastern United States. So if you were in the eastern United States um, and you were looking at different animals, you would look, you could use this to kind of help you identify what they were. So always start with number one. So here's your two statements, your pair of statements. The mammal has no hair on its tail. The mammal has hair on its tail. Which one goes with this organism? Right, it has no hair on its tail. So what do we do? Go to step two. Pretty simple. Here's step two. Answer these pair of statements. The mammal has a very short naked tail. The mammal has a long naked tail. It's kind of hard to um, see in this picture and there's another thing you have to do is you have to look at their physical characteristics. So if you cannot see the organism, if it's underwater or hidden, you might not be able to use this. Um, This one has a um, 
we're going to say it has a long tail. It's not very, very short. So I'm going to say it's a long tail. Um, so we're going to go to number four. Do, do we skip three? Yes. It says go to step four. It's okay to skip a question. We're not going to answer every question. You just do what it says over here on the right. Go to step four. So let's go over here to four. The mammal has a flat paddle shaped tail. The mammal has a round skinny tail. I would say that this is flat and paddle shaped. So we know that this organism is a beaver. So you can write beaver right here. So now let's go to the next one over here. Look at this uh, organism, this living thing. Where do we do we start where we left off? No. We start up here. Always start with number one. So we're gonna just look at this one organism and start with number one and do the same thing again. This mammal has no hair on its tail. This mammal has hair on its tail. Yeah, I know it's kind of hard to see, but we're, it does have hair on its tail. So we are going to step three. Skip this one and go down here. This mammal has a black mask. This mammal does not have a black mask. Which one goes with this? His, he doesn't really appear to have a little mask shape like a raccoon. His whole face seems to be black. So I'm going to say he does not have a black mask. Go to step five. It's okay to skip this one. We're just going to go to step five, do what it says. Uh, the mammal has a long furry tail that is black on the tip. The mammal has a long tail that has little fur. So I know again it's hard to see, but it has a long furry tail and it does have a black tip. So this is a long-tailed weasel. Let me put that right there. So again, you can only use this to identify uh, certain um, mammals in the eastern United States. So they have dichotomous keys for everything that they've classified. So um, you just have to find the right key and then that can help you narrow down uh, which animal or organism you're looking at. Okay, finally. When we talk about living things, we're not just talking about animals. We're talking about plants, too. So here's one for plants. It's set up a little bit different, but again, there's two statements. You have to answer yes or no or left or right or whichever one you answer. It tells you which way to go. So we'll do this really quickly. If you look at this, um, this leaf, which leaf is this? They don't always have pictures there. Sometimes they do, but that's not the point um, because you know, you know, every leaf they're very similar, but they're not exact. So, um, and sometimes it, it is kind of hard to to just look at one and tell. So, answering these questions um, will be helpful. So, the leaf has three or more veins, the leaf has a single main vein. Now this one has more veins over here. You can see how these are the main veins that go through the leaf. The leaf, the leaf that we're looking at right here has one single vein. So we're not going to go this way. We're going to go um, this way. So follow this over here to these two, this pair of statements. The leaf has no teeth.
no lobes. The teeth had the leaf has teeth or lobes. You have to know what teeth are. It's not talking about in the mouth. It, it's hard to see again on these pictures, but you can see these little jagged edges right here. Those are called teeth. If you had the leaf in your hand, you could touch it, feel it. It'll be a little bit easier to um, see also. But these little jagged edges, those are called teeth. So it has teeth. So we're going to follow this line this way. And then it says, it is somewhat lobed. It is not lobed. Lobe, I guess it's kind of think of an earlobe, how these little loops or these little... Um, sections right here. This is one lobe, two lobes, three lobes. So it really doesn't have that. It's just a smooth arc right there. So it is not lobed. So we're going to go down this way. And then finally it says the leaf has veins that end at teeth. See how these veins end at a little um, tooth right there. This one ends at a tooth. This one ends at a tooth. The leaf has more teeth than side veins. And you can see um, on our leaf up here, they all, all these little jagged edges, all, they don't have all veins that go to each one. So it has, definitely has more teeth then it does have veins that run up to, to the edge. So, I mean, you probably could have looked at this picture and see, saw that these are the same, but this is an apple uh, leaf. Okay. All right, so anyway, those are just two different kinds of dichotomous keys. It may be like a little diagram like this, or it may be, uh, more like this, and you just answer the questions and go to the next number. So, okay, guys, I am so proud of you for staying with me and answering these questions and um, underlining and highlighting these. You need to do the lesson review that's in Canvas and uh, finish that up. And if you, um, I will check it. Let's say by by Friday, so you can work on it today or um, tomorrow and have it done by Friday and submit that the lesson review. All right, hope you have a great day. Make good choices, and I will see you tomorrow or later.